Hey, Seth. So last week we talked about how virtual crimes don't just stay on computers, that computer crimes can touch the physical world. We talked about swatting and we talked about a gentleman that died over swatting. But this week we have violence as a service. So let's go through our usual uh, case details that we go through at the beginning of every episode. So about our case today, the technology, we're going to talk a little bit about Discord chat servers, which is uh, some chat servers that we discussed in episodes one and two. You're going to see it comes up here in episode three as well. And we're going to talk a lot about cloud accounts, um, not real technical about them other than what gets stored on them and um, how it was used as evidence in this case. Sure. Uh, the crime here. And we're going to talk a little bit later about the potential motive here, because that's a little bit less clear. Um, this one's really one of the more violent ones we're going to look at. So this one involved violent crimes of shooting and firebombing, uh, as well as swatting, which uh, we did talk about in a prior episode. So the criminal in this case is a young man named Patrick McGovern Allen from New Jersey. Yeah, and we'll learn more about Mr. McGovern Allen in a bit. His name becomes fairly important. Um, the victim. So there was a pair of families from Pennsylvania. Yep. Two different residences. And I tried to think what we talk about the clinchers in all these cases. And I tried to think about what were the clinchers in this case. And once again, we see that the virtual harm crosses over to physical harm, um, which is one of the big reasons why I picked this case. And I put this case after the case that we did in episode two, because it shows you that the violence that we talked about it's it's not just a one-off. It's actually people do it as a service on the internet. You're going to see that all over this case. And the common theme is, you know, how really do you can you defend against this? I mean, how can you defend against a person coming to your house and shooting up your house if someone out there incentivizes them to do that? So all this stuff we'll talk about in the episode. So with that, sit back and enjoy episode three of E-Crime Bites. Okay, so as many of you know, we try to add a bit of a personal touch to each episode, talking a little bit about essentially making fun of ourselves. Uh, Keith and I are both beleaguered um, uh, husbands and, and parents to children. Um, so I, I thought it was my turn to come up with a pretty good story. But in this one, I really, I, I tried coming up with a story where I was the uh, the source of the, the humor here. And I have plenty of those, but frankly, none of them really match uh, a story about my father. So uh, real quick, this is like the late 1980s. Um, I lived in suburban Westchester, New York. My mother had taken my sister and I out for a morning of shopping and errands. And my father stayed behind on Saturdays to do housework, you know, usually playing with his cars or his motorcycle as he was prone to do. So we came home after lunch and we walked into the uh, kitchen and my father's name was Roger. And he was a pretty big guy, about 6'2", 220 pounds. And there was a Roger shaped hole in the ceiling of the kitchen and my father was sitting at the table with a pretty uh, confused and unhappy look on his face, and his thick black and and salt you know salt and pepper hair was smoking uh, as if it had been on fire. So after my mother laid into him with a fantastic set of expletives, wondering what the f had happened to her kitchen and what the heck was he doing, and this sounds uh, straight out whatnot, of Looney Tunes. My father explained. I'm sorry, what's that? I said, this sounds straight out of Looney Tunes, but continue. Right. It, it was really straight out of Looney Tunes, or frankly, straight out of The Simpsons or Family Guy, Choose Your Poison. So uh, the story goes, my father uh, was in the attic, which was accessed through the garage, doing something, pulling out a part he needed or straightening something out. He wasn't straightening anything. He didn't clean, but he was pulling out something. And the phone rang. And for some reason... That's only known to him. He felt the need to get to that phone. Now, keep in mind, this is the late 80s. We had portable phones, but he didn't choose to bring one with him at that time, but still thought he had to answer that phone. So in an effort to answer the phone, 
he stood up from whatever he was doing and made an effort to get to the stairs down the attic. And in doing that, he ended up whacking his head against the ceiling light in the attic, breaking the bowl and catching his hair on fire. And in an effort to pat his hair down and uh, stop the fire from running over the rest of his head, he fell through the ceiling of the kitchen. (laughs) Uh, He wasn't hurt, uh, I guess, other than his pride. Uh, There was a lot of sheetrock damage. And my mother really let him know how she felt about the whole situation. And to this day, my sister and I have really never laughed any harder than we did on that uh, that, that, that that fateful afternoon. I'll never forget it. The image of a Rogers-shaped hole in the ceiling is embedded in my memory forever. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I was going to say you had me when you said Rogers-shaped hole. <laughs> All right. Well, that's awesome. Let's uh, let's now continue on to our case. So the very first date that we need to be concerned with is December 18th, 2021 at approximately 1228 a.m. So at this point in time, a house fire was reported in Abington, Pennsylvania. When officers got there, they found that the house was partially on fire. Now, here's the important thing. A shattered bottle of Mad Dog 2020 was found on the ground in front of the fire. So, Keith, let's talk about what is Mad Dog 2020? You know, I haven't. So I did did the research on this episode. And uh, when I ran into this, it was like I had a flashback to the 90s when I was in college because that was the last time I've seen a container of Mad Dog 2020. And I do not have any fond memories about it. But it was a... um, from what I remembered, it was a very not so tasty fruit type of liquor drink. So Google will tell you that Mad Dog Twenty Twenty, and you should totally Google it. It comes in a very um, colorful set of bottles. Is a Ford American fortified wine, and it's called Twenty Twenty because it stood for twenty percent alcohol in a twenty ounce bottle. Um, and that, I mean, I'm not even sure what to say about it other than, I guess, in college, it might have been a, uh, a fairly saucy drink to have. It looks pretty disgusting to me, but I don't really drink. So what do I know? Yeah, I, I last time I remember having it was, oh, gosh, it was early 90s. And it just, I don't remember a good taste from it. And, you know, when the officers found this bottle um, in front of the fire, they said it smelled a flammable liquid. And I was thinking about it. And I can't even remember having a positive smell memory of Mad Dog 2020. So maybe it was just the Mad Dog 2020 that smelled like flammable liquid. Right, I'm saying it could have been the actual liquid consumable itself and not any kind of accelerant. Yep, yep. So officers, they did did find this bottle. It smelled a flammable liquid in all seriousness. And um, it was around the window where it was thrown. And where around the window where it was thrown, it was... On fire, so there was fire damage there. Yeah, so, we'll come back to why the bottle was found around the window. Yeah, in, in a minute, because there's gonna there's some evidence. We're gonna show you some evidence, or at least we're gonna we're gonna make some evidence audible for you, is the best that we can. So at the scene, also a piece of slate was found, and think of this as like a piece of rock. And the homeowner thought that the slate was used to break the window. So as you can imagine. When the officers and emergency crew got there, there's a fire around the window. The window is broken, so it kind of looks like somebody threw something into the window that was on fire. And there's pieces of it outside the window in the yard as well. Um, The homeowners heard the crash when it happened. They smelled the smoke, and they said they heard some voices. They said they weren't recognizable. You know, They didn't know who it was that they heard the voices, but they did hear some voices. And then, um, so emergency crews are called around midnight for this around 3.30 AM. Unfortunate for the homeowners after emergency crews left and all that, the house reignites and causes more significant damage to the house. And the residents were still home when this happened. Yeah. So, you know, we try to keep this fairly fun and silly, but imagine being in your home, it's after midnight and, uh, somebody throws basically a Molotov cocktail you know, at your home and you you have to call the cops, the fire department, and then it gets reignited, causing fairly significant, you know, damage to your home. So um, pretty awful stuff. 
and uh, a fairly serious crime. Yeah, of the shittiest, shittiest alcohol you could find of the, in the shittiest market. alcohol potentially <laughs> available on the market. All right. So another important fact here um, that I found in the court paperwork, not a much about it, but it was important to note that the victims were previously the target of multiple swatting calls. So for those of you who are not familiar with our prior episodes, Keith, what is being swatted mean? Sure. It was our last episode and it was when you have emergency services called to your house falsely. So it could be because someone says your house is on fire or that could be because someone pretends to be you and says I'm a shooter and I'm holding people hostage. It could be pretty much anything that will send fire trucks and police cars and any other emergency services to your house. Right. And there's ramifications to that, right? It's, it, it pisses off the homeowner. It pisses off the emergency service provider. The town doesn't like it. It's it's really a, a pretty significant thing to do to somebody because it has a pretty impactful um, consequence to it. Yep, it does. And now we're going to switch to January 2nd, 2022. Right. So it's two weeks after the first fire we just talked about. So I'll go through this. So this is at 2 a.m. There are reports of shots fired at a house in Westchester, Pennsylvania. They, uh, the police report found seven spent shell casings were found along with a silver magazine containing a live round for a handgun. Bullet holes were found in the home uh, by a large bay window. Uh, apparently bullets had gone through the residence and were found in a wall, in a piano leg, uh, the stool for said piano, and a small table. The homeowners were home, but were luckily unhurt. Apparently they, quote, feared for their lives, unquote. Now, a video appears on the internet. This is where I had a lot of thought of how we're going to do this on a podcast. So to you listeners, we're going to try to explain we're going to play the audio and we're going to try to explain these videos that we're seeing. And um, I hope to also link to them, hopefully through um, the podcast, uh, you know, the summary and stuff like that on our, on our podcast site. Yeah. So, and these videos are like eight seconds. You're not, you know, yeah. it's not a big investment in your time, but if you wanted to see them, they're also out there and you can also Google them. But so, with that said, a video appears on the internet, and it was the homeowner that reported that there was a video of the shooting circulating on Discord and Telegram, which right there, my red flag went up, and I was like, why is the homeowner telling the police that there's a shooting of my home on Discord and Telegram? That seems like you're almost involved with this, or, you know, it just seemed very, very weird. And uh, Keith, is it worth mentioning to our audience, again, what Discord and Telegram are for those who are not particularly familiar with those kinds of chat services? Sure. And if you missed episodes one and two, we talked about them a little more in depth. Um, Discord and Telegram are two different types of chat services on the Internet that people, when they're out there doing bad, they tend to use. I mean, these these services are used for good purposes all the time, but... You'll see in a lot of these cases that uh, the attackers or the criminals will go to these two particular chat services, the Discord and Telegram, to communicate with other people online. Right. So in the video, we have a white male in a dark Air Jordan hoodie, a dark balaclava, which is like um, uh, a sock that goes over your head and your neck, uh, but leaves your face open. I wear it when I ski. Um uh, and dark semi-rimless glasses. Um, and the uh, the white male was shooting a black Smith & Wesson gun into the front bay window. And we're going to play the video. You'll only be able to hear it. But you can very clearly hel- have a, hear a voice yell out, Justin Active was here! Um, the homeowner believes a female was staying at the house. Her initials are KM. And that she was the intended target. So when uh, Keith and I were researching this this specific crime, I, my first question was, well, what was the motive here? So it's a little bit unclear, but we believe that um, this was some kind of retaliation or revenge for a, a relationship with KM that went south. Yeah. So what I do, what I did is um, I pull up the video here and Seth and I are going to take a look at it and it's going to play. I'm going to play the audio straight through once just so you kind of have an idea on the timing and what it sounds like and so forth. And then we'll kind of. 
um, we may comment about. Uh, we'll describe different... what we're seeing and we'll comment yeah. on it. We'll, we'll break it down, I guess, uh, in the second round. So here we go. You ready? Yeah. Justin Active was here. Justin Active was here. Justin Active was here. Puss. Fantastic. So and that that was it. Let me try seconds. to let me try to relive what we have. So we have some grainy footage of somebody brandishing like, like a silver plated um, small caliber handgun. Not that I'm a gun expert, and he's kind of adjusting his hoodie. And it's like you hear, you're ready. And they're like walking past a bush to a clear resident residential house that has a. You can see very clearly the uh, the gutter drain, um, and you can hear before he fires the weapon as he aims it at the the window. He's probably twenty feet away, and um, you hear him whisper, "Just an active was here." Then you hear, "What was that? Four or five shots fired?" And you can see like the actual explosion of fire because it's at night, uh, very clearly. And then the shooter I, yells I out, eight. "Just." What's that? I, I counted eight shots. Was it eight shots? I, I, you know what? I have to hear it again. Um, and then you hear the shooter yell, Justin Active was here. And then as he's finishing saying it, almost like they're in a uh, concert, one of the cohorts yells out the same thing. Justin Action was here. But also, I think we got it cut up, but it sounds like they yelled pussy. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I thought, too. So. Which is kind of weird because if they're shooting at a female, would you call a female that? I don't, I don't know. Why would you do that? Uh, yeah, that's... That's out of pocket. Anyway, let's play it one more time. <laughs> All right, so we're going to play it uh, through. It's just going to be 12 seconds here, and here we go. You ready? Yeah. Justin Active was here. Justin Active was here. Justin Active was here, puss. I think it was I think I eight or nine, nine shots. Yeah, I think I counted nine. Yeah, it's a... Uh... They, they they empty the better part of a magazine into somebody's house at you know apparently uh, twelve thirty in the morning. No, no, this was different. That was a, that was a shooting. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think I did a pretty good job describing it. Actually, it's fairly short. They definitely announced who provided the shooting, videoed the shooting, and then clearly uploaded it to more than one chat service. <laughs> You're going to see that all these kind of fall in the line <laughs> evidentiary wise for law enforcement later on. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's like the videos are out there and it's just, it's not good. Yeah. Not exactly a stealthy uh, crime here. So while investigating the shooting, the detective discovered a video of the fire bombing that we talked about and they, um, they determined that the second video was of the Abington fire bombing that we talked about. They uh, linked the same. So these two di these two videos are of two different incidents. And because they have them from the same source, and we're going to talk a little bit about the source here when we talk about the evidence, it links the same people to two separate incidents, which is important. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and play this firebombing one. Uh, for you as well we're going to sort of do it the same way we're going to play it for you once and then explain it to you and then play it for you again but um before we get to playing the video do you want to um walk them what they should expect to hear seth sure so we have a pair of suspects both appear to be uh white caucasian uh one suspect used a, a black and red lighter uh, to light what appears to be a blue cloth on fire that was stuffed inside a bottle of previously discussed Mad Dog 2020. Uh, another suspect threw something through the window to break it. That was likely the piece of slate that was found. Uh, the second suspect threw the, the lit, and let's call it essentially what it was, it was a Molotov cocktail, um, but missed the smash window pretty badly, by the way. I mean, he was probably less than five, six, ten feet away from it and uh, kind of whiffed on the throw. But yeah, it, it was did. Um, it was really so, bad. <laughs> yeah. But the uh, the bottle did bounce back outside. However, he was successful in uh, lighting the side of the house on fire. But if the intent was to have the inside of the house lit on fire, which was clearly the intent, thus the prior breaking of the window with the piece of slate, that was a pretty big fail. Yeah, if they would have got that into the house, that house would have been gone pretty quickly because 
the fire, you can tell the fire catches outside pretty quickly. So let's go ahead and just, uh, this video is 14 seconds long and I'll play it for the first time here. You can light it, light it, light it. You can light it, light it, fucking light it. So the chuckling you just heard was Keith and I laughing. So the first like eight seconds is very close, you know, camera footage of a couple of hands, you know, first holding the mad, the mad dog and the cloth. And then you hear, light it, light it, fucking light it. So they proceed to light the mad dog. And then they pan to the house, literally less than 10 feet away. Um, and, they could have uh, dropped it. They could have reached dog. in and dropped it at that point. I mean, they were right. So they, close I don't know why it. they didn't actually make it easier on themselves and just go right directly next to the window and drop it in there. But they threw it, missed, thus probably saving the house, um, and threw it at the. Uh, well, again, it looks like it hit like at the bottom left part of the window uh, underneath it, and uh, that's really it. But you definitely hear "fucking light it, fucking light it," uh, which is a little bit Beavis and Butthead. Um, I guess a large part of this story may, may fall under that category. Though. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. But you know, the point is, is like they hit it and it must, it broke and stuff. So the liquid is all over the side of the house. So that's enough to catch the house on fire. But if that would have gone into the, whatever it was, the living room or whatever it was in there, that, that place would have been, it would have gone up so much faster, so much faster oh, for than sure. it did. For sure. Let me play it through one more time for audience. Just so since we explained it to them, we'll give them a, uh, one more listen to this in case they don't want to download it for the internet from the internet themselves. Here we go. You can light it, light it, light it. You can light it, light it, fucking light it. It's like ninety percent of the liquids outside the house. It's so bad. Yeah, we also got cut off where clearly something was screamed pretty loud to let the homeowner know something was about to happen here, but we don't know what it what it was uh, said something um, starting with an F, but it wasn't a curse. I don't know. Um, but anyway, more importantly, this is where I think we found the specific electronic communication part of this crime to be so interesting, where um, the actual um, chat group Discord went above and beyond and did the right thing here and actually reported a crime. Yes, they did. You don't see this happen very often. So there's this group inside Discord called the Trust and Safety. So at this point, the court document said that uh, Trust and Safety is responsible for monitoring, detecting, and responding to potential Discord user behaviors that violate guidelines or laws. So... They're looking for people doing bad stuff on their service. And what I thought was pretty interesting in this is that Discord went and talked to law enforcement voluntarily. Um, usually it's law enforcement going and having to pull information from these online services. But in this particular case, it was the trust and safety team that uh, helped bring um, these criminals to justice. So Discord comes to law enforcement and they said there's an individual with the username tongue pound sign 0001. And don't really worry about what the pound sign is. I think that's like a Discord user number. Just remember the word tongue. And we're just going to address this person as tongue through the rest of this podcast, um, even though his moniker is a little bit longer. Tung was identified by Discord through chat stating that he shot a residence and was willing to commit fire bombings. Yeah, let's make it clear. He had claimed that he shot a residence in the past tense, but was, quote, willing to commit fire bombings, which indicates a future tense. Thus, the whole violence for hire thing or violence as a service. Yeah, and Discord provided data that said he said he being Tung said in March 2022, now I'm going to quote unquote here, and then I'm going to back up and try to explain what he really says. So in March 2022, he says, quote unquote, if you need anything done for dollar sign, LMK, I did a shooting, Molotov, but I can also do things for your entertainment. So the LMK is just stands for let me know. 
And what he basically, if I could just break it down on what he's saying, he's saying, if you have money, come to me. I can do physical violence. So it can be shootings, Molotov, cocktails, and other things for your entertainment. So here's the thing that, trying to get in the mind of a criminal. If I was going to try to capitalize on committing violence, which is committing crimes for money, and I wanted to continue doing that, assuming the money was pretty good for such a thing, wouldn't you want to be able to be kind of, sort of on the down low about doing it so that, you know, you didn't go to jail? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But Right. So, and I get, you know, the guy before, in the videos we saw, I didn't yell out his name. Oh, wait, he did. But. <laughs> well, he, he yelled a name. A name. He yelled a name. <laughs> but then to, you know, also upload files to a fairly public website you know that is definitely i mean he used a moniker of tongue it's not rocket science to back into who the owner of that you know specific um uh, handle is and we had our prior we did learn in a prior episode that you know i guess certain handles are more valuable than others and maybe harder to track down but we'll get into how this one was tracked down yep and so law enforcement starts looking at the discord um data the 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 data that discord trust and safety is provided to them and there's other other chats in there so he um on april 2nd 2022 starts discussing a video showing the shooting at a house and discloses details related to the shooting this is the user tongue um states that the video is such and such as house it's the victim's house getting shit shot just inactive was her current BF. I imagine that stands for boyfriend. The reason it happened. So that's why just inactive was here. So if I could translate to layman out there, what that mean is what that says is the video is of this person, this victim's house being shot. Just inactive was her boyfriend. And that was the reason it happened. And that's why we yelled, Justin Active was here. Notice that they said that was her current boyfriend and not former. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's a pretty caustic relationship. And then more importantly, perhaps the chat, a user in the chat group asked, why did they shoot her house? To which we believe Tongue uh, responded, quote, because they got paid. Well, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, a different user, not Tongue. Uh why would the shooter house responded with because they got paid well? Well, it, no, that's actually um, what you're talking about. There is uh, tongue. So when the person asked them, why did they shoot their house? Tongue says, because they got paid well. And then someone says to that person, tongue. Now I'm going to edit this. Usually I read you the court documents, but there's some racial lingo in here that I'm just not comfortable with. So go with me. <laughs> the other person in the chat states, it's you, N-bomb, Pat. So, ignoring the N-bomb there for a second, and we were just talking about young white kids. They said his name, Pat. So, you're going to see later on, you know, we like we gave you with the uh, um, uh, case information up front, Pat is this person's name. So Yeah, and he actually, we know this because he responded with, yeah, they's me, that's. Which, to translate, yes, that is I. He is I. I am him. Yeah. I assume a lot of this is maybe fat fingering a phone or something, because it Could looks be. like um, when we make these pauses, it looks like it might be new lines or something, because they just sort of have slashes in them. So um, other chats, the user references to traveling to other states and commit shootings and bombings, um, and just says that there's other Discord users that knows about, quote unquote, my shooting. And then there's other chats out there that this user also responds to the name Pat and Patty. So let's get into who is Tongue. So the, the subscriber info led to a Gmail account, um, Pat the Bat 28 at Gmail. Um, and our notes on this are kind of mafia wannabe. Uh, you know, my handle is that Pat the Bat. 
Uh, and we'll wait until you see how gangster he really is after he's caught. Well, well, stop there for a second. Even before he got caught, this this motherfucker can't even throw six feet, six feet tops, tops. He can't even he can't even reach his arm in and drop a Mad Dog twenty twenty into, into the house. But he's he's running around calling himself Pat the Bat. <laughs> yeah, it was probably much a, a false advertising on Pat the Bat for sure. Um, I think uh, when my kids were like eight, they had a better arm. Um, the Discord Trust and Safety Department also stated that they have billing records for a Discord um, user, uh, 5348, who we know is Tongue, as Patrick Allen, who his address is listed. I'm not sure we need to list it in this specific podcast, but he lives in a specific town in New Jersey. Um, and that is... Uh, the gentleman's address of record, Patrick McGovern Allen. And that is his full name, Patrick McGovern dash Allen. So Patty, Pat the Bat, was fairly easy to track down here through the cooperation of Discord. Yeah. Once they got that email address, things started falling into, into place, including the jokes about Pat the Bat. Yeah. So more on who is Tongue. So the court records talk about the police officer serving a search warrant um, on Google uh, or the content of the email account, Pat the Bat 28 at Gmail, the email content received included, and by the way, I've yet to work on a case where I've had uh, much success, although I guess most of my stuff isn't criminal, um, getting a commercial uh, email provider like Google to provide emails so quickly. That's really interesting, but I guess I'm not law enforcement. Um, the email content received included two emails from Discord to which identified the user as Tongue. Uh, there was also an email located, um, uh, a Discord email from late December of 21, emailed entitled, Warning, Violation of TOS, or I guess Terms of Service, Community Guidelines Notification, which stated, quote, Your account is receiving this notice due to participation in a server that violates our community guidelines. Specifically, EXE's cash-out server allows or facilitates harmful activities related to cybercrime. So Keith, you want to interpret what this means? Sure. It's so basically law enforcement had access to Pat the Bat's Gmail account and saw this email that came back from discord that said, you're doing some shady shit on our servers. And that stuff is um, cybercrime. Yeah. So they, that helps them. I think that would help law enforcement in the end, basically even show a stronger connection between, yeah, this email address really is registered with discord because we're seeing these warning or these like, um, I don't even know. Yeah. I guess warning is the word they use on there. This warning email address coming or this warning email across path the bat. Right, Discord. unless you think that, well, how do we know it wasn't somebody else using Pat the Bat's e Gmail account and it was actually not Pat the Bat himself or, or Mr. McGovern Hill, Allen rather, McGovern Allen. So we know this because um, the content of the Discord chats also make it clear that the user is McGovern Allen by associating him with his place of uh, employment, which is an Italian restaurant called A Touch of Italy. Uh, we know this because he says that in a message dated February 12th of 22, New Jersey employment records confirm that Mr. McGovern Allen's most recent employment was, quote, at a touch of Italy in his local town, and that he'd worked there in the first quarter of 2022. And in the same chat, user 5348, also known as Tong, tells his chat partner that his birthday is the 4th of July and that it was known uh, by another user that Mr. McGovern Allen's birthday is... 4th of July, 2001. Yeah. So as an attacker, he's leaving out a, or he's, he's letting out a lot of information about himself um, by saying, by answering yes to Pat and, and uh, all this other stuff that we're showing you. Right. Further corroboration uh, indicated a simple search of photo records indicate that Mr. Patrick McGovern Allen, Pat the Bat is a white male who wears glasses with, dark semi-rimless frames. This is consistent, of course, with the brief image of the person seen in the shooting video. Yep. And another thing is inside those Discord chats with other people, he provided his telephone number or his mobile number to other users. And get this, 
he gave it to him. And I'm not going to read his whole number on here, but it starts at the 609. You know, so it's the area code and the seven numbers. And someone says, is this, which ends in 2227, is this 2227 number your burner phone? And Pat the Bat, he replies, nah, my main. So yeah. he that's like his real, real cell phone. It's not even his yeah, burner phone. So he phone, wasn't even using him. like a separate communication device to take calls to you know solicit crimes. Yeah, so what did law enforcement do at this point? They took that cell phone number and they popped it in their law enforcement databases that they have and they figured out it was serviced by T-Mobile. They went to T-Mobile and said, who owns this mobile phone number? And T-Mobile came back and says, this phone is subscribed to Gregory Stengel. And Gregory lives at that address that we talked about earlier in New Jersey that was associated with Pat the Bat. And then... um. Law enforcement, what they did is they did a review of public re- records and they figured out that Gregory Stengel is Pat the Bat's grandfather. So Pat the Bat lives with his grandpa. And even worse, Pat the Bat, his grandpa owns his cell, owns his cell phone. So he must pay for it or something. So this guy, Pat the Bat, real tough. Yeah, yeah. It's uh it's a pretty depressing picture. Um, so the police officer who is, you know, the investigator of the crime. They served a search warrant on T-Mobile for a cell phone site tower, and they were able to confirm that that 609 number uh, and a review of the call records and data sessions indicate that um, Pat the Bat's telephone moved from New Jersey uh, to the vicinity of the arson that was committed in uh, late December of 2021 and the shooting on January 2nd. Yeah, and let's let me read because this is really interesting. Um, this is a snippet of the court document and uh what I'm going to do is I'm going to read what they did to track his cell phone within certain mileage and minutes and so forth and how close they got it. All right. So this is one of those quote unquote moments where quote unquote, more specifically based upon December 18th, 2021 data sessions and calls made or received T-Mobile reported the location of the device associated with the telephone number ending in two, 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 seven to be within one mile of the arson 17 minutes after the homeowner reported it to the fire, reported the fire to 911. So what they have is his phone within one, not only within one mile, but they had it within one mile of 17 minutes of when the family reported the fire. So they, they have it really nailed down. And so then they looked at January 2nd, 2022, and they reported his phone to be within a location of two miles of that shooting within approximately five miles or sorry, five minutes after the shooting occurred. Now this is important because these locations and I'll go back to, sorry, quote unquote, again, these locations are approximately 75 miles from Pat the bats, New Jersey address. So he didn't just accidentally go to these places. He went to these places and his the cell phone, his cell phone's GPS um, correlated with that. Well, not only that, but the next sentence is also telling that Pat the Bat's cell phone did not interact with those specific cell towers that corroborated his location at the two crimes at any other date. Yeah. So he went there for those crimes, did them and left is what that said. Yeah. I mean, there were so multiple pieces of evidence tying him to this crime. So, um, yeah. All right. So. Let's tie this phone to the crime scene. So now they have a phone number, right? So they can then take that phone number and start looking at online accounts. And if you have an Apple iPhone and you have a phone number, they can then go to iCloud and start asking for data using their law enforcement uh, subpoenas and so forth. So they did. They went to Apple and they said... um, Can you give us any data for any of Pat the Bat's identifiers and his phone number? And Apple identified at least two iCloud accounts with the identifier. One of them is just Patrick 609 and the other one is OMG Pat 666. Can we talk about that? That is a fantastic handle. (laughs) OMG Pat 666 is really terrific. I don't know. My favorite still is Pat the Bat. Yeah. 
also equally excellent handle for sure. Yep. So both accounts were linked to that phone number, the one that ends in 2227. And the account detail records associated with those iCloud accounts. Um, one of the account uh, holders name is Patrick I. And he lists his address as the uh, one New in Jersey New Jersey address. that we've been yeah. talking about over and over. So the other one, the OMG Pat 666 lists Patrick Allen as the account holder and also lists the same address that we've been talking about in New Jersey. So it also lists the address or it lists the T-Mobile telephone number 2227 as the verified telephone number. And remember when you have a verified telephone number, that usually means you have to go through some kind of process. It means you put your phone number in and then it says, okay, well, I'm going to text you with this phone number. Tell me what the code is. And then you put the code back in. So that's what I mean when, when I say it's verified. So the kicker here, did you want to say the kicker? I was going to say, I mean, so they've all kinds of corroborated evidence that it's him. It's his cell phone. Um, it was him at the team of the crime through phone GPS. The accounts associated with his cell phone associate with the user or the, the, the subject or the suspect with the specific um, home address, that home address associates with the phone number home address. So, I mean, they basically have him dead to rights. And the issue then becomes, well, so they clearly filed an indictment on him. Um, but the whoa, description whoa. of the crime... Let's back up. You forgot the biggest piece of evidence here, Seth. Do you know what was in the iCloud backups? The videos of the crime? The videos of the goddamn crime! Yeah, so... Uh, not only was he committing the crimes, he was clearly proud of them and did not want to, uh, I guess if you're selling your services, um, although I might have edited out the uh, Mad Dog uh, window miss. But I'm finding the, the actual count against him to be kind of light. I mean, one could argue that was attempted murder uh, by firing a weapon into a populated house and firing or, or attempting to throw a Molotov cocktail, which is a bomb, into somebody's house. And they got him on account of uh, stalking. And, yeah, that uh, was, I guess uh, it was a plea arrangement. Well, no, that was um, September 1st, 2022. So on September 1st, 2022, the first, what they did is they came out with an indictment. And they said, we have one call, one count that's going to be stalking. Then time passes. It's now October 22nd of the same year. So it would be a little, about a month and a half later. And a superseding indictment comes out. And now, I think this is what you're looking for, Seth. You have three counts on there. So we have count one, which is traveled interstate commerce with intent to harass and intimidate. And that was for the Abington Township in PA incident. Count two, which is use fire to commit stalking. And then count three, which is travel interstate commerce with intent to harass, intimidate. And that was for... The one in West Town, East Goshen Township, which I forget. There's a, I forget the original town, but the the place they attacked that was in this township. So here's the thing, though. I mean, I am a lawyer. I'm not a criminal lawyer. It is reasonably anticipated that if you fire a, a weapon, a fire a gun into a populated house, you might kill somebody. You certainly might shoot them, maim them, harm them. Um, I'm surprised that there wasn't a, a more aggressive count that was, you know, plead out like attempted murder or, you know, second or third degree murder attempt, attempted murder. Um, but again, I mean, you know, we can only infer so much from the court docs and I don't know what kind of initial, um, you know, deals that may have been made between the defense because clearly they had him dead to rights here. So I'm willing to bet you that these counts were kind of preset so that they knew he would plead guilty to them. I would agree, given what comes next. And um, the town that I forgot just previous to you talking was Westchester, Pennsylvania. That's right. the one that is also in West Town East Goshen Township. So fast forward almost a whole Nope, not a whole year. I guess some several months. And we're now February 9th, 2023. So, so last we're week. recording this. Last week from the time of this recording. Yeah, it was last week. And this is why I'm so excited is I always do a check on cases right before I, you know, we go through and do the recordings and so forth. 
and he pleaded guilty. So I originally researched this and I was like, oh, this guy, he definitely looks guilty. And I stopped there and then I did my check and I said, oh, sweet. There's an actual plea. And he did. He pleaded guilty to all three counts. There was no other information. Usually what happens is um, when someone pleads guilty is they uh, publish this document that not only when they plead guilty, they talk about what they plead guilt or what they did during the crime, what they're pleading guilty to. So uh, a lot of these times in these episodes, I'm able to tell you so-and-so did such and such because they said my plea, my plea agreement that I did that on such and such day. Unfortunately, in this plea agreement, it was sealed. So I don't really have any other information. I can't tell you exactly what he said he did, but he did plead guilty to everything that we told you about. And I did want to make a note that sentencing is set for May 23rd, 2023 at 10 a.m. So it would be neat to have an update on this particular case. And I'm just saying it because um, don't expect us to come out with an episode in like May, late May with uh, an update on this. Because what's going to happen is the court's going to get a hold of this and then they're going to have a hearing and then somebody's going to object and they're going to have a motion and the sentencing probably won't happen until like late this year. So as soon as I find out that something new happens with this one, we'll maybe have like a mini um, episode in the middle of the week to give you. Yeah, it's a good idea. Happened. Maybe we'll do like a wrap up for season one about, you know, things that we learned for certain cases that didn't have a definitive conclusion to it. Yeah. And so I'm, as you can imagine, when I'm doing the research on this, I'm Googling and I'm finding all sorts of stuff on our subjects or criminals in these cases. And I'm also finding stuff on just normal people. And you got to kind of look at each one and go is you know, is this part of the case or is this somebody else? I ran into one that was definitely this part, part of this case. And I just thought it was really humorous and maybe it was just too much mad dog 2020 who knows, but it's a picture of a car in sort of like an apartment complex front door sort of wedged kind of cockeyed in there and it's it looks like so the connective part between in an apartment building between one building and the other uh where you would either get it go to get the mail it looks like or go up or down go up rather uh to apartments on the second floor and in between this um literally into the wall of the left side is a four-door vehicle uh that really shouldn't be there because it's off the sidewalk and clearly not on the street yeah like a mid-sized four-door car and like imagine like you were going to drive your car into the front door of a uh, apartment complex. That's what you have here. Yeah. And so the, it's just reported in the newspaper as Patrick McGovern Allen of this place in New Jersey was injured Monday afternoon after driving into a Pleasantville building, forcing residents from their home. City police patrol units responded to the 1100 building of Falcon Drive for a report of a car into a building according to a news release from police captain Matthew Hartman. So the key takeaway for me on this is uh, Pat the Bat has better aim with his vehicle than with his hand in terms of dry, throwing something through a window. <laughs> That's awesome. He does. And the date on this, this is September 24th, 2020. So I believe this may have even been prior to his crimes. All right. So let's wrap this one up, Keith. What did we learn here? All right. So the first thing that bubbled up to the top for me when I was looking at this in comparison to our other cases that we've given to you so far is discord and telegram. They come up a lot and I'll tell you, I've researched out to episode, I think I'm on episode 13 now and discord and telegram. They continue to come up in almost every case. Well, and let's also say this discord for sure. Unless we know less about telegram in this case, absolutely was doing the right thing morally and legally, and legally, don't forget, there's a lot of privacy laws in place to protect, you know, these providers of these services so that they don't necessarily have to provide this information to, you know, law enforcement. They can say, hey, we didn't know what he was doing. You know, they, you know, there's a little bit of leeway on that legally, but they went and did the right thing on this morally. And they basically, you know, set in motion the, uh, the efforts to uh, capture the bad guy here. Yeah, definitely. Well, Seth, give me, give me our second bullet there. So this is really, really critical. Um, clearly mad dog 2020 makes a better molotov cocktail than a drink <laughs> definitely if if you got the right arm 
If you have the right arm, right. I mean, again, I haven't tried Mad Dog 2020, but I'm willing to bet it's as disgusting as it looks. <laughs> it, it is. From this what next one should be fairly obvious, but maybe not. Keith? Yeah, I'm going to actually hit the next three because they're kind of related. So Yeah, go for it. Here's the next three in order. The first one is don't film your crimes. And the next bullet is definitely do not keep videos of those crimes on accounts that be, can be traced back to you. And don't leave your GPS on when you're shooting up a house or trying to burn one down, especially if you're videoing those crimes as they happen. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, um, I was watching a TV show and one of the lines was really sharp. It was talking about how a mobile device is essentially a tracking device that can also make phone calls. And uh, that's actually fairly accurate, right? I'm not even sure whether his GPS was turned on or off made a difference. I'm pretty sure they could have tracked him down just by use of, uh, you know, cell phone activity. So, yeah, um, triangulating. Tri uh, yeah, yeah, there's me, all kinds of ways to, you know, track a mobile device. So just be aware if you want to commit crimes, you probably want to do it with your phone turned off or not on your person. And then the most important thing on this potentially is, was there a defense to this? And, you know, Keith and I went through this. We're not really sure, right? I mean, you know, pick who you date very carefully. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, swatting is, is tough, right? I mean, somebody can just do that, you know, randomly, right? Or they can do it, you know, uh, because they have a vendetta against you or a reason to upset you. So I don't know how you could, you know, really, because, I mean, obviously you want to be able to use emergency services if you should ever have the need to call the fire department or the police department or an ambulance. So uh, I don't know how you defend against a SWAT. And, you know, in terms of having somebody come shoot at your house through a, a window or throw attempt to throw a Molotov cocktail through your window, you know, I mean, we can get into a whole side conversation about appropriate home defense. But if you're at a place where you need to start putting up like aggressive home defense, uh, maybe you need to reconsider, you know, who your friends are or, or who you're spending time with. And one last point, Seth, is if somebody needs a bad deed done, you can probably find somebody else on the Internet out there that's willing to do it for money. You know, I'm sure I that's mean, true. In, this, in this case, we had, um, you know, a couple of parties that were unhappy with uh, a couple of victims in Pennsylvania, and they happened to find somebody online that would, you know, do it for whatever, you know, Bitcoin or whatever they chose to give him. And he went and shot up a residence and firebombed another. Right. All right. So I substantially shortened some of our contact information to just giving you our website because I tried to put every link on it. So that way you just have to remember the website name and then you can go to all our social media, get our email address and all that stuff from it. So all you need to remember is to go to www ecrimebytes.com and I'll spell it for you. E C R I M E B Y as in yellow T E S dot com. So it's spelled the computer way. B Y T E S. And we have all our social media apps, um, podcasting apps, email addresses and everything, um, all the episodes and descriptions and everything all on there for you. Yeah, thank you for, I think this was a great episode. I enjoyed this one and uh, certainly looking forward to the next. Please follow us um, and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys next time. Yeah, absolutely. And you do look forward to what we have coming down um, the pipe for you guys. We have, you know, Twitter hacking. We have an individual called Plugwalk Joe that has a pretty um, illustrious criminal life. We have some ID theft in Florida coming at you. We have some swatting in Maryland. We have some stalking behind a badge. So we talk about police officers going bad in Kentucky in one episode. We have another company that has a um, number of issues with payroll. And then we have some credit fixers. And then we'll switch into some spies and nuclear secrets in Annapolis, Maryland. And yeah, that's a good one. Um, Seth's going to do a research an episode after that. And then I'm going to talk to you about a doctor that does some evil. So as you see, there's a bunch of different types of topics coming at you. So if one of them um, wasn't all that interesting, hopefully we're going to have a completely set, completely different e-crime bites topic coming down the pipe that you'll be interested in. So we look forward to hopefully seeing you at episode number four. Thanks. Thanks.